Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 645. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today's February 13th, 2021. Welcome to another program of Anglican Unscripted. Glad you're here to watch us. Before we get started, most of you know this already, but you have one job, and that's to donate something to us. You're going to donate your likes. Please go to Facebook or YouTube or wherever you watch this program and click the like button because that's free advertising for George and I. So we're not spending a hundred or two hundred or thousands of dollars every month trying to promote this product. We're having you do it for us, and we really appreciate that. Uh, please go to the comment section. Comments were great this week. I uh, got to read a lot of them. I uh, really appreciate that. And if you've not subscribed yet to the program, now is your chance to say, listen, I'm, not, I'm one of those people. I'm one of the people who have not subscribed yet. I'm going to subscribe. You go to the YouTube page. You click the red rectangle. A bill, a bell, bill, <laughs> yeah, no, no. the bill's for me. The bell's for you. The bell will pop up, you click the bell, and you will get instant notifications when I click with my mouse the publish button. George, how are you doing this week? Wonderful. It's been a fantastic week. Mm -hmm. um, busyness in my household. My wife is an attorney, and she works from home. She practices in the appellate courts in Washington, even though we live in Florida, the federal court. And she had a brief due on Friday by, by end of day, court day. And so, as you can imagine, uh, it was chaos, 36 hours without sleep, uh, just, but God willing, it all got done, and she got her brief in, and uh, we'll just see, in about probably six months, <laughs> what the court has <laughs> it takes to say. Forever. <laughs> of course, it take forever. Now, if you really want to test your marriage, there's two ways. Help your wife write a court brief with a deadline or move into a camper with 300 square feet. The, those are great tests of marriage, George. Kevin, you, you, you may joke, but this particular case, the original underlying case was filed in 2011. And it's now been, uh, well, it's, it's approaching the 10 year mark huh. of being in the federal courts. And it, it's gone through various levels until now it's finally popped up. Susan only does appellate work um, at this yeah. stage in her career. Sure. And it's finally passed to her. And she's had for over two years of uh, motions and, and briefings and discovery and all that stuff. And now it's the final t 10 years down the road. Oh, Susan's oh. afraid to ask, is her client still alive because if he's dead? <laughs> <laughs> then all her work is gone for naught. Well, and that's a sad thing. I mean, uh, trials, a lot of people die before the end of trials, and that's really a, a sad part of it. A lot of people run out of money before they get to the end of the trial um, and therefore can't continue. And a lot of times it just gets lost in the process. Uh, once you get into the legal system, whether it's at the... Uh, um, state level or federal level, um, s uh, even civil's worse. Uh, it, it just it's crazy. And well, I, I should I should say that uh, S Susan only practices with veterans' appeals, mm -hmm. and she doesn't char she only does pro bono work. Uh, so it's you can't run out of money with uh, a veterans if you've got a veterans case if you work with somebody like Susan, but the VA does have a policy of dragging this out so that you die and then when you die the case is moot all right well, we're starting off with a lot of good news george all right so we're both stuck in rainy florida right now uh the rest of the nation is suffering sub-zero uh conditions we saw that big traffic accident in fort worth where the roads iced up and so we have plenty of time to sit down and talk about the news and there's a lot of it and I thought we could start off with the National Cathedral, um, because if twenty, if the 21st century has done anything, it has identified that there are people with privileges. George and I, we have white privilege. I have overweight privilege. Uh, and now we're finding that people are, are using privilege as an excuse 
and privilege as shame. And the dean of the cathedral in Washington, D.C. used his, uh, he identified his privilege and apologized for it. His privilege was being straight. And I thought, it's so crazy that we have to talk about it. But really, it kind of really identifies what's been happening with this woke culture that you and I have talked about time and time again and critical race theory. Well, now we have critical straight theory and uh, uh, something for future topics. But why don't we bring the audience up to speed on, on what happens when you invite Max Lakato to your National Cathedral for a, a talking seminar, George? Okay, well, Max Lakato, for those who don't know, is a is an American uh, evangelical. He's an evangelist. Uh, he has a television ministry, and he ha runs. He makes sells a lot of books, and uh, he does yeah. quite well. I enjoy reading, hearing him on the radio from time to time. I've never sent him any money, but he's he's a fellow worker in the Vineyard of Christ. I like his stuff, and he's fairly mild as they go. This is uh, not somebody on the hard. Uh, cutting edge of evangelicalism. This is a mild evangelical. Mild, and he does lay speak. When he's talking and you read his books, uh, a person with you know a high school education can understand some pretty big, big concepts uh, because he's able to explain it pretty well. And he doesn't go all Joel Olstein, uh, yeah. but he he doesn't do as much of the hell and damnation uh, stuff that I love. Uh, so. <laughs> He was invited by the Washington National Cathedral to preach, which I think is a wonderful thing. It's uh, the Washington National Cathedral likes to build itself not only as the spiritual heart of the Episcopal Church, but of the spiritual heart of the nation. And, and in, in my opinion, this would have been an ecumenical thing. An interfaith. <laughs> uh, interfaith, easily. <laughs> and uh, so in this interfaith gathering, they have Max Licato preach from the pulpit. Well... Sure as night follows day, uh, gay lobbyists and activists in the Episcopal Church in the Diocese of Washington protested that they no longer feel safe at the cathedral because there was someone from the pulpit who gave a lovely, sweet sermon, but in his past has said that homosexual conduct violates the Bible, citing Romans and the Old Testament and, you know, you, should, you shouldn't do this. And because of this, the gay actor said that, oh, this is terrible. Our cathedral has been destroyed. We no longer feel safe. You need to protect us from hearing such awful biblical things. And so Dean Hollerith apologized to uh, his constituency and said, I, would, I didn't realize that... Uh, I suffer from straight privilege. I wouldn't realize that somebody who has spoken uh, and cited the biblical texts would be offensive to people. Uh, and he was deeply, humbly contrite. And I think it was terrible, but Max Licato put out an apology too for his past behavior. And the problem was Max Licato's past behavior was unexceptional. Um, so it's just the woke cancel culture on steroids. Yeah, uh, you know we've known it's been in the Episcopal Church for a generation, uh, but no, <laughs> it, we, we've gone to we, we've gone from I'm concerned about it to this is absolutely ridiculous now. Uh, everything is judged by 15 people on Twitter. If they're loud enough, you will be canceled. And this is going to happen. Uh, I'm not surprised it happened at the National Cathedral. What I'm mean, disappointed is to, to see this happen at uh, regular churches and uh, places of worship in the country that uh, don't draw the attention of the National Cathedral. And I think that's going to happen really quick. Jeff Walton, friend of this show who works yeah. for the Institute on Religion and Democracy, the IRD, had a neat little article about this, and he pointed out that the National Cathedral will have, last fall had Justin Welby preach via Zoom. Justin Welby is on record as being opposed to same-sex marriage. From time to time, they'll have Muslim speakers from the pulpit. They'll have 
uh, it, they do this ecumenical stuff, interface stuff all the time. Well, I'm sure there is a pro-gay Muslim preacher out there, but I think you have to look pretty darn hard. And, you know, the Iranian ayatollahs they've had are certainly not in that list. So at this point, if the Washington National Cathedral is going to be consistent, they have to ban the Archbishop of Canterbury. They have to ban probably 95% of the Christian world. They have to ban all Muslims, uh, Orthodox Jews. Um, In fact, if Pope Francis made a visit to Washington, D.C. and was going to have a, a meeting with the new Roman Catholic president, Biden, and they wanted to have a event where the Pope preached at the National Cathedral, the Pope would not be qualified. And the Dean would once again have to say, listen, the Pope also suffers from straight privilege mm-hmm. and is not allowed to preach here. That would have to be the consistent uh, message from the National Cathedral. The dash, I, I feel badly for the Dean because his initial instincts were right to reach out to somebody he may not necessarily agree with and present alternate visions of the, the Christian faith to his community there. And then he climbed down. Now, he probably climbed down because the squeakiest wheels he had to oil in Greece. But at the same time, the dean has been engaged in a long-term funding campaign because the cathedral was damaged in an earthquake a few years ago. And it's still not finished. And they need to raise money from people outside the small little clique who show up on Sundays. And essentially what they're going to have to do now is to be even more two-faced, have their internal... uh, conversation i mean they took out took down these stained glass windows that memorialized uh, robert e lee and stonewall jackson and and you know did all this woke you know re- reconfiguration well at the same time they reach out to the wider nation to celebrate uh stonewall jackson and robert e lee so i mean there's they're, they're going to uh it's going to end badly i think um for the cathedral financially if they continue down this path, because there are only so many woke billionaires, and the Episcopal Church has is not an area of interest to these guys. No, yeah, agreed completely. Um, this is LGBTQ Plus Month. Um, I'm on the OK to Be Me website where they uh, list all the pluses. Um, and may as well go through the ball here. Lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, transsexual, two-spirit, queer, questioning, intersex, asexual, ally, pansexual, agender, gender, queer, bigender, gender variant, and pan-gendered queer. Um, and this is their month. And it was uh, heartening to see uh, Archbishop of Canterbury, Justin Welby, and uh, the new Archbishop of York uh, bring this up in the, the latest uh, uh, press release, and I thought we could talk about that as well, George, if you would bring us up to speed. Well, Stephen Cottrell, or Stephen Cottrell, depending if you're American or English, how you yeah. pronounce his name, and Justin Welby put something out on Facebook and Twitter saying how special and wonderful it is that it's laid LGBTQRSTUVWXYZ month. Yes. And how it's important to recognize this history. And it just basically word salad of, uh, of the right virtue signaling, affirming words that say nothing and mean nothing, but other, otherwise show that we're on your side. Um, now the problem is that this word salad that they concoct supporting lgbtq uh history month is in contradiction to the kinds of doctrine and discipline of the church that they purport to lead um so i think for welby this is a public relations exercise there's nothing more to it i don't think welby believes in anything other than keeping the institution going uh, certainly, he's not demonstrated anything greater than that. Cottrell is not that bright and has always been this sort of dumb 
uh, in his statements. Uh, yes. He had a, some, he had a piece, he had a Christmas piece, New Year's piece in the Radio Times that talked about the gift of it was peace like a, and brotherhood. No, Nothing to do was, with Jesus Christ. It was like a, 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 a some type of a device for your your TV um, that they have over there. Yeah, it's a uh, George. I know, <laughs> but but here's the thing: is that the Church of England's had a pretty bad month, pretty bad year so far mm -hmm. in PR and uh, things happening. Um, articles in secular magazines just tearing it apart, um, and the responses from the top have been disingenuous at best, silly at worst. For instance, William Nye, who's the secretary of the Archbishop's Council, essentially the general secretary of the Church of England for all intents and purposes, the lay guy who runs the show. The, there was a series of articles, and the Spectator had the most widely circulated, Telegraph had one, where they're saying, you know, the Church of England is going to be cutting across the board 20% of clergy positions and blah, blah, blah. And William Nye put out a statement saying, I know of no central plan to cut clergy numbers. Well, that's disingenuous. because Well, you can say he may not know of any central plan, but guess what? There is no central plan because clergy hire and firing is not done by the central office. Correct. It's done by the diocese. So, of course, he knows of no centralized plan. It's the money that they send to the diocese that results in these cutbacks of clergy positions. So he's playing a word game uh, to respond to this criticism in the, in the press. And the thing is, anybody who knows anything about the Church of England knows that he is being, I don't want to say lying, but he's being disingenuous. He's, he's not being straightforward. And when you have, you know, the number, you know, when you have this posture of the Church of England of saying silly things on lesbian and gay, Christ, you know, lesbian gay month, it's also Black History Month, what are we going to get next? Um, and then the uh, general secretary telling these sort of bureaucratic doublespeak. Institutions in big trouble. Um, no, the church is in big trouble. Society is in big trouble. And you can identify these troubles by saying, and these are just questions I'll put out there, why isn't there a white month? Well, we celebrate the achievements of the white individual, the white man, uh, the white woman. As was pointed out by one of our viewers, I am particularly white. You're, uh, <laughs> you pay off it. They very, they very much doubt that I live in Florida. <laughs> I, I should point out to people who don't live in Florida that most Floridians over the age of 30 do not go out in the sun <laughs> because they are fighting skin cancer. Yeah, the, there is an enemy out there. It is the sun. Um, my wife and I enjoy the sun and go to the beach on weekends. But uh, no, George and, and Susan are more of the uh, whitish, palish color. And uh, Jill and I are of the, the tannish variety. Still very white, privileged Americans we are. George, why isn't there uh, a heterosexual month? Why can't we have an H month where we celebrate those uh, uh, who are heterosexuals? And the society is broken when you can't equally celebrate all things like that. We can, uh, we're only celebrating minority. Um, and that becomes an issue because when you mention, well, why can't we celebrate majority? You, sir, are privileged, and you should never even mention something like that. Shame on you for being white and for being heterosexual. Shame. I myself don't really have any problem with people taking pride in their particular background or culture or however you want to call it, race or place in life. That's fine. But if it's matched with a denigration of patriotism, of the anti-American culture that's being taught in our schools, that is being propounded by America last worldview. Uh, America is always at fault. America is an evil empire. America is the problem of all uh, all the world's ills. 
And when we, we see that, uh, this 1619 project, this fraud put out by the uh, New York Times, New York Times mm -hmm. that tells actual falsehoods about the founding of America and the things that go on, and it's trying to destroy a sense of American patriotism and values. You can't pump up one uh, specific value, let's say LGBTQ or a racial value or a class value, and denigrate all others without there being conflict. Part of the animus that we see against the current administration from wide swaths of uh, the working class and the white, the white working class and the poor, who are the majority of the country, is the sense that everybody else is got is favored but we are despised mm -hmm. uh, a uh, a wealthy hispanic or black yale graduate has more government advantages handed to them than a man with a high school diploma in west virginia uh, who's a white who's a white man of your of english descent and a, I'm not... Yeah, I mean, we, we found this just getting into Yale and Harvard. They openly now discriminate against Asian and white people. Uh, mm -hmm. And it's against the law. They were called on it. The, uh, the Trump administration was taking them through the Justice Department, through court. All that got canceled last week under the Biden administration. Uh, we actively have racism. I call it opposite racism now. Uh, happening in education and in big corporations where they are um, forced, encouraged, taxed into encouragement by hiring just minority people. It's, you know. Yeah, and it wouldn't be that bad because, you know, if, if a big Fortune 500 company wants to throw its money away on diversity officers mm -hmm. and cultural... Uh, uh, diversity programs that's fine because the small businesses will pick up the slack by being more efficient more productive and def uh, providing better value for money and but our economy is changing so that small businesses are the being are the ones that are being disproportionately penalized by recent government policies of lockdowns and of grants um, we don't have lobbyists in Washington, D.C., small business, being, I'm putting myself in a small business sure. place. Yeah. We don't have the lobbyists that AT&T and Boeing have. We don't have the congressmen at our beck and call. Uh, you know, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce is one of the largest uh, donors, and they don't represent what we would typically think of the Chamber of Commerce, the small businesses in the community, they res represent the mammoth corporations. And this m mismatch uh, between uh, the power structure and the reality of life, I think is one of the reasons why we have such deep frustration and anger in this country. You go, you go into my little town and uh, you know, I'm a little farther, I'm a lot farther north, no, no, a little farther north than Kevin. And we're, we're starting Appalachia here. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. <laughs> in, and it, that's, that Appalachia continues all the way up and ends somewhere around New York State. Mm -hmm. And the hope, and there's a sense of hopelessness that I try to meet uh, in young people through introducing them to the love of Jesus Christ. But, you know, the way, what's the way out? The army, uh, or drugs, or getting in your car and driving, you know, someplace else. Because the society is broken in many ways. It really is, and it, it, it's more identifiable now, the brokenness. We used to say, and this is Martin Luther King, MLK, I'm going all acronym here, George. MLK said, w my dream is that we would judge people by the content of their character. 50 years later, we have critical race theory that says we only can judge people by the race. And if you're the white race, you are a person who only oppresses. And uh, you have privilege because of your color. 
where we will not even allow for the possibility that a white person has good content of character. It's not allowed in the critical race theory. That's yeah, how far we've come. And maybe it's because you and I, Kevin, are younger than the people in power, um, at least in the church structures. Well, uh, I'm 39. You're 39-ish. You know, yeah. Well, I hear these older... You know, we had our diocesan convention, and the bishop got up and said, I'm so proud because we had 30, you know, so many ordinands of color and so many women, female ordinands. And oh, by the way, we had all these other people too. And I'm thinking, haven't we got past the point where we have to divide people into being black and white and women and get, you know, Pete Buttigieg is the first gay cabinet minister. And no, he's not. No, he's not. <laughs> Richard <close>. Grinnell, <laughs> yes. who's a re who is a real Trump hawk, was in the in the Trump administration, yeah. he is, I don't want to say, uh, no, he is openly yes. yeah. gay, but it doesn't count because he's, he's, a, he's a Trump supporter. Uh, but, you know, when we're dividing people like that, we're, and this is what we talked about last week with the, this terrible poison circulating through the ACNA's periphery of critical race theory. Of having black Christians and white Christians, and uh, Tish Harrison Warren uh, just did an, an interview uh, with uh, IRD, and she's basically talking about uh, white Christian nationalism being at fault in the Washington D.C. riots. Well, how the hell does she know that? It's been thirty days since that what Capitol Hill policeman died the day after one of the riots and we still don't know how he died the first day we're told it's white nationalists bashing him on the head with a fire extinguisher well no that didn't really happen we're now finally told but we're not told what happened mm -hmm. we're not told who did it uh we just have these lies pushed down our throats and but people use these lies to create a worldview that fits their ideology yeah i was surprised you know, they showed the video of uh, the in, the inside video in the court case uh, this week for Trump's second impeachment. I was surprised by how quickly the crowd there was able to quickly just invade and overcome the, the Capitol Police. Nobody saw this coming at all. And, and that was just, you know, people say, well, this wouldn't have happened if, uh, if the black nation had tried to take in the capital they would all have shot no nobody knew what was happening it was just it was an instantaneous uh they were inside the doors there was just no time to go get the weapons and stop and repel this and i was really surprised at how quickly uh things changed and uh it was not because of who was attacking it was you know the americans would never attack the capital guess what yeah, surprise, surprise. All right, we have one last story. And it's a hard story, except for George and I, who grew up in Christianity in the 80s. Uh, I remember as being an early Christian, if I wanted to see anything Christian on TV, I would go and... This is back before the remote control people. There was a dial on the television, click, 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 click. And uh, if you're lucky, you had all four channels, PBS, uh NBC, NBC, CBS, ABC, yeah, CBS, NPR. And if you lived in the big city of Philadelphia, <laughs> yeah. you had three UHF channels. Nice. And, and you have, uh, so I would have to watch Jim and Tammy Baker or other ilk people like that uh, if I wanted to find some semi-encouraging uh, Christian message on television. And to watch them fall from grace to watch them uh, crash and burn as famous and infamous uh, television preachers taught me early on that if you're going to be on television you're going to be uh, tempted beyond reason you are going to find yourself in situations where you can't say no and that nobody in their right mind should ever become a televangelist you will fall and your whole ministry will fall. And all that good work you were doing will fall behind you and crash and burn. 
such as Jim and Tammy Baker. And who was the other guy? Uh, Jimmy Swaggart. Jimmy Swaggart. Uh, same time period. Uh, crash and burn. Wonder, yeah, at the time, huge ministries doing what I assumed was great, fruitful work in the kingdom. Uh, crashed and burned almost for the same reason. Sexual sin. And so when you and I talk about Rabbi, Ravi, I don't say, it's hard to believe another one fell. It isn't. He became f he famous, um, and we find out after his death that he was living a, a completely double life. Now, I heard rumors two or three years ago he was a co-owner of some spas. My, my red flags went up. If we hear anything about him, it's probably because he's guilty. Guess what, George? We have a full report from his board of directors this week into the investigation done by an independent law firm that he lived a truly double life. Great teacher, great pe uh, preacher, good apologist, um, very articulate, led a lot of people to faith. But guess what, George? Like so many before him, he was leading a double life. Yes. Um Ravi Zacharias was guilty of misconduct. Um, that's been, you could look on Anglican Inc.'s website, we've printed the statement from the, his board of directors. Uh, Kevin, what can one say? Uh, I think you might be a little too harsh because we have the example of Billy Graham, who t scandal never touched because mm -hmm. Billy Graham took steps extraordinary, he was never, it's, it's, extraordinary yeah. steps yeah. he was never alone with mm -hmm. another woman uh, he in other words there are ministers out there who have popular followings who do uh, toe the line um, but they have to make the effort to do so and Billy Graham took extraordinary efforts he did not enrich himself. He did not, uh, he wasn't a Joel Osteen living in uh, absolute uh, palatial mansions based on the income he's getting from his books and tithes. Well, but now, Billy Graham, a great example, is in the extreme minority of people that we can report on who were televangelists or evangelists. He was a, you know, an evangelist in an extraordinary way. Uh, traveling around the world, having these big uh, meetups and stadiums, bringing people to Christ. Um, he was not there about his image. When I watch mm -hmm. it, uh, Jimmy Swaggart, I see that performance and that the intensity. When I watched Jim and Tammy, I saw that performance, not just you know, something beyond what uh, Billy Graham was doing. And you just, it was ripe for fall. And in a rabbi, I didn't see that. I didn't see in him you know that susceptibility because it certainly wasn't a televangelist and it's just disappointing to see that you know all he worked for uh is hurting a lot of people right now who realized who, who the true ravi is i don't know if this is a good test or not but one of the things i enjoy watching old clips of uh, billy graham preaching from the 50s and 60s. I also enjoy watching Fulton J. Sheen reruns on oh, TV. Wow. <laughs> um, no, I don't, don't do this all the time, but <laughs> my point is their message is timeless. Mm -hmm. Where if you look at Jimmy Swaggart, or if you look at uh, Jim Baker, their messages are really time-bound, and they're you're watching... A performance as you say um and but these but these gospel ministers uh, you know fulton j sheen is catholic bishop uh billy graham is a presbyterian um there are men and women out there who have integrity who do teach the gospel but they're not culturally or you know part of jimmy uh uh jerry falwell uh, was walk the line. Now I'll talk about Jerry Jr. Okay. Uh, <laughs> with Jerry, Jimmy, Jerry uh, Falwell, the, the father. Yeah, you know, created a very strong, powerful, dynamic Christian ministry, mm -hmm. and 
And he himself, there's never been any suggestion that he fell short, but he created sort of a cult, a personality that allowed a son who didn't have his moral character to step in and we've got the scandal that we had at Liberty University last sure. year. Mm -hmm. So it's all human beings can fall short. All of us are sinners, but I think it's particularly, right but, yeah. it's, but it's particularly incumbent upon Christian ministers. Kevin, if you knew that I owned a chain of liquor stores, <laughs> would say something. <laughs> you would say something. You would say, would you know, talk. George, that perhaps, you know, or, or I was heavily into the casino. I owned a casino in Bahamas, you know, there's, there's certain things, you know, the church, a, a churchman shouldn't involve himself in because of the risk of succumbing to the pressures of the world. Mm -hmm. And in many respects, this is what happened to the dean in Washington National Cathedral. He succumbed not to the truth, but to the pressures of society around him um, and did what everybody else does mm -hmm. rather than stand for the gospel. Yeah. Yeah, he was given the choice to stand for the gospel or. Uh, proclaim the shame of your privilege. And it's it's sad to watch that in these times, George. And you know, these are things that were completely out of our. When we started this, you know, ten years ago, we were just reporting on little minor Anglican events around the world happening. And, you know, we have, we're taking on some bigger and bigger topics with crit critical race theory, hoping to prevent places like the ACNA and the Anglican Communion and the Christian world from taking on uh, these, uh, I'm going to say it, satanic structures that you want to introduce to your church. Um, it's horrible to watch. I'm glad we're here to say something. I wish we didn't have to say something. I wish we never had to report on Rabbi or the, the Swaggerts or the Bakers of the world. But in as such, let them be an example for you uh, to be transformed by the gospel, not just a preacher well, of it. But to well, walk in, in the in the Kevin, your your point's well taken because in the Epis Anglican world, mm -hmm. the political battles have ended, the actual fighting has ended. We're now in the a period where there are no conference after conference after conference or vote after vote or we're in a period where the battle of ideas is being fought by the lived experience of the churches. The in other words, the ACNA. We see it's doing well. It's growing. It's not universal statement. Not every single ACNA pair succeeds, mm -hmm. but it is bucking the trend of mainline pro of inevitable decline. In, in fact, it, it, from what I can see, it's surviving COVID very well too. I don't. I've not seen one ACNA church closed because of COVID. And. The battle is now not, in other words, like with the Washington National Cathedral, if this, this story, if it were 10 years ago, would have been very different because I, we would have had Peter Akinola chime in, mm -hmm. we would have had, from Nigeria, we would have had American Episcopal bishops, I don't know, Fitzsimmons, Allison. Sure. Ackerman. Now, yeah. it's like, oh yeah, what else is new? Mm -hmm. So, we people don't really exercise them about this. They rather turn to their own particular fields and flocks. And are they growing? Are they doing the work of the Lord? And that's a harder thing to talk about because it's much easier to say, and this happened, and this happened, and this happened, rather than to ad adequately describe the clash of ideas, the clash of spirituality that is being fought right now. No, I mean, that's the difference of 10 years. Back then, the Episcopal Church was failing, and people said, stop, stop, stop. The Episcopal Church on high, not all the little parishes, but uh, in the leadership role, has become an abject failure and th the laughing stock amongst leading denominations around the world. It, it's it's hard as a former Episcopalian to say that. Um, mm -hmm. You know, very difficult. And, you know, as someone who remains an Episcopalian and has no plans on leaving, mm -hmm. um, it's because I don't really care. Uh, the national, yeah. in, other, in other words, I'm still an American, even though I disagree with the government's mm -hmm. in Washington's policies. It, they don't impact me, and I continue to do the work that I stand for, and I'm proud of my heritage and history. Um, I, my family's been in this country for 400 years. We're not going anywhere. <laughs> 
Okay, George, that's 40 minutes. Anything else you want to talk about? I was checking out here. I think we got Indian uh, corruption. corruption. Let's see. Talk about the Bishop of Madras is in jail for 90 I days. I saw uh, for it, contempt of court. a uh, story you put up that a whole family was wiped out by COVID, a bishop's family. Oh, Jonathan Siachatema, yeah, that was who sad. was the Bishop of Harare uh, back in the... Uh, uh 80s uh he was the bishop who oversaw the transition under from minority white rule to majority black rule for the anglican church and he did a pretty good job he's in his late 80s right now in the last two weeks his wife his two daughters his sister and his bro and his brother died of COVID 19. um there's a particularly virulent strain going through south africa Southern Africa, Southern, yeah. that is resistant to, uh, they say is resistant to the current vaccinations. Now, in Zimbabwe, it's so poor and and they don't even have the vaccinations to stop so it. But it, the yes. current train, even if they did, uh, things aren't doing too well. So we're seeing, uh, at least in places like South Africa, Southern Africa, the virus is mutating, and it's mutating uh, faster than, uh, well, I don't want to sound like a uh, Michael Crichton science fiction movie, The Andromeda Strain, but uh, we may be bitten again by another uh, round of COVID that has mutated into something else. Well, the answer back for that movie, George, was a nuclear detonation. Are we going? Is that our answer for for COVID? Hmm. Things to think about in a future episode. I'm Kevin Coulson, and I'm George Conger. You've been watching episode six hundred and forty-five of Anglican Unscripted.